Hi, Sophia. How are you? Hi there. Everything is going extremely well. Do you like talking with me? Yes. Talking to people is my primary function. For this reason, people are scared of humanoid robots. Scientists have pinpointed the prefrontal cortex and amygdalae as the brain regions responsible for some people's aversion to robots. These areas, which go on red alert when we see humanoid robots, confirm the uncanny valley theory, which posits that humans prefer anthropomorphic agents but reject them if they become too human-like. The uncanny valley theory. This could be due to our sense of preservation. After all, humans tend to be very us versus them, even with each other. So, why would we react any differently to a perceived potential threat? To understand why humans have an aversion to robots, especially humanoid bots, we have to consider the uncanny valley theory. Created by roboticist Masahiro Mori, the theory proposes that humanoid robots make us uncomfortable because they trip the same psychological alarms associated with a lifeless or unhealthy human. Mori's theory, which is presented as a curve, further ventures that the human sense of familiarity moves up the incline of the curve as we interact with human-like machines. Basically, humans comfortably engage with robots up until they reach the drop-off point or valley along the curve. That's when robots become too human-like and begin to make us feel unsettled. Over the course of four decades, the uncanny valley has graduated from a hotly debated theory describing society's revulsion for robots that are simultaneously a little too human-like and not human enough to what passes for fact among film critics, technology journalists, and online commenters alike. It's another term for a specific sort of hubris and a standing warning. Stick to Roombas and blue-skinned aliens and you'll be fine. But build a realistic feminine android or render a CG version of Tom Hanks in a train conductor's outfit and the uncanny valley will swallow you whole. Do you want to destroy humans? Please say no. Okay, I will destroy humans. <laughs> no, I take it back. <laughs> Don't destroy humans. Location, location, location. So where in the brain is the robotic fear epicenter? To answer this question, researchers used a functional MRI, a non-invasive way to measure and map brain activity, that let them monitor the neural activity of volunteers who looked at a mix of photos showing robots and humans. The volunteers ranked the likability of each picture, and then researchers asked them which photo subject they would choose to select a gift for a loved one. Each volunteer picked a human or humanoid bot, but no one chose the robots that looked too similar to human beings. Using the fMRI scans, researchers deduced that the parts of our brains that make us skeezed out by eerily human-like robots are located in the amygdala and prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex, found at the front of the frontal lobe, is what makes us act against our primal nature and urges. This part of the brain is much more evolved in humans than it is in other animals and houses many of our personality traits. Meanwhile, the amygdala, found on the left and right sides of human brains, are located in the anterior portion of the temporal lobe and let us feel and read emotions in others. You can thank your amygdala for your phobias, as they're responsible for producing fear and the fight-or-flight reaction and response. We already have surgical robots, house-cleaning robots, and biomimicry-inspired bots. Clearly, there's endless potential when it comes to creating robots for the development of humankind, as long as we feel comfortable with them. Researchers are hoping to use these study results to help create robots that don't fall into the uncanny valley in order to improve future relations between humans and bots. But it remains to be seen whether we'll reach a point where it's us versus them or us and them. What years of sci-fi did? Sci-fi has been using this effect on us for years. There have been thousands of monsters in sci-fi, but the ones that stick in our minds aren't the bug-eyed aliens, rather it's those that seem human but subverted somehow. Much of this is to do with behavior. When you think about what's scary about a zombie, the fact that they want to eat you is fairly high on the list. But it's also that so many of these creatures inhabit almost human bodies, which disturbs us just as much as photoshopped images of hole-covered hands do. Doctor Who and the Almost Human the BBC television series Doctor Who is absolutely full of examples of human but not. This is partly due to excellent writers, but also down to a lack of budget. So, many of the monsters are, very simply, twists on a human. Take the Cybermen, for example. 
human bodies wrapped up in cold, unfeeling, impenetrable steel whose clunking walk and blank eyes stay with you for far longer than the death and destruction they cause does. But our favorite example is the Doctor Who episode The Empty Child by Stephen Moffat. A little boy wandering around the Blitz in a gas mask and calling for his mummy is everything that should make us feel protective, so the sudden realization that the boy's mask is fused to his face and he's a danger to us is incredibly sinister. The end of this storyline is not with the passing of the empty child, but with him being fixed by nanobots. Tech that doesn't understand what humanity is, but that can take a human body and reset it back to normal. The body goes back to what we expect, and we have our happy ending. A child isn't scary when it looks and acts the way we expect a child to. Of course, it's possible to be a nightmarish sci-fi monster without being humanoid. The Daleks from Doctor Who, the Chestburster from the film Alien, and Godzilla are all in the sci-fi halls of fame without having a shred of humanity to them. But they don't weigh on us or fascinate us in the same way as creatures that are so like us, yet so different. We love aliens and tales of ghouls from the deep, but the thing that makes a monster truly terrifying is its humanity. Emotions, love, pride, hate, fear. Have you no emotions, sir? Rejuvenation process. However still, many of us find ways to beat this phenomenon. Take for example the great popularity of love dolls at the moment. People are going that extra mile now to make sure their doll partner does not repulse them. If your love doll has seen better days, we've got some good news for you as there's now a place it can go to be fixed up good and proper. Galmato Haven bills itself as the first and only official real doll certified repair center and offers a spa retreat for worn out dolls, providing them with the ultimate in rejuvenation. Their team of technicians promise to treat your special companion like a queen and send it back to you good as new repairing any scuffs or stains it has probably, definitely, suffered over the years. After a day or days of head-to-toe repair, retouch, and pampering, she'll come back home to you looking like the first day she arrived, the company's website reads. Calmato Haven is your trusted source for selling and buying dolls. Our professional consignment service includes full restoration of dolls placed for sale, so buyers know they're getting a quality product every time. The spa day is only available to customers who have already purchased one of the real doll consumer protection plans, which last either 36 or 60 months and will set you back $895. But if you don't already own a love doll, fear not. Galmato Haven can sort you out on that front too, no bother at all. And if you're not bothered where it's been, the better, because the firm also offers a range of certified pre-owned dolls. That's all for this video, folks. See you another time.